It's often remarked that the Wachowskis' 2008 film Speed Racer looks and feels like a cartoon. It's a remark that is sometimes used pejoratively, a way of critiquing the film's garish color palette the colors. Stop the colors. and childish tone. At the same time, the film's defenders will remark that the film's cartoonishness is deliberate. A major repeated complaint was that it looked like a cartoon. Well, yeah. Unlike the majority of comic book and cartoon adaptations made in the 21st century, which tend to make things more gritty and realistic, Speed Racer, its defenders will say, is unusually faithful to the visual style of its source material's medium. And that uniqueness isn't a bad thing, it's simply an innovation that went against trend. But Speed Racer isn't just cartoony, it's in some sense about cartoons, and more specifically, the medium of animation. We get two explicit nods to this in the film. The first is in the film's opening sequence. We get a flashback of the young Speed bored in his classroom, daydreaming about the one thing he loves and drawing a flipbook. This is quite literally showing us how animation as a technology fundamentally works. A succession of still images flipping by one by one yields an illusion of movement. We see another nod to the illusion of animation later in the film during the final racing sequence. A sequence of still images of a running zebra lines the walls of the racetrack, only to spring into animated motion when the camera tracks laterally across it. The zebras are a clear homage to Edward Muybridge and his experiments photographing a horse in motion, years before the Lumiere brothers even projected the first photographic moving image in 1895. So what's going on here? In this video, I want to suggest that these little acknowledgments of the technology of animation can not only explain the film's deliberately cartoony aesthetic, but can also explain why the film's distinct aesthetic has something to do with the place of animation in film history. Speed Racer isn't just a cartoony movie, it's a movie about the technology of animated cartoons and the history of the movies. From the flipbook, to cell animation, to computer-generated imagery. So what exactly counts as the technology of animation? In these examples, the technology of animation means the illusion of movement synthesized from the succession of individual images. This illusion is the technological basis for all movies. It's not just the ones we call animation. But this isn't the only technological aspect of animation that Speed Racer refers to. The Speed Racer cartoon that the film is based on is not just a work of animation, it's a work of cell animation. The cell was an important labor-saving innovation in the history of the medium. Instead of having to redraw the figure and the background over and over again to create movement, the animator would place new transparent sheets of celluloid over a single background painting. In essence, cell animation creates an unbreachable rift between foreground and background, between animated figures and their environments. Though it was the goal of Disney to disguise this rift, you can always feel that difference. Even in highly illusionistic Disney cartoons, the animated figures are never as beautifully shaded as their backgrounds. And their bodies sometimes seem to float above the spaces that they occupy. Speed Racer creates a set of aesthetic design choices that recreate this rift between foreground and background. One of the film's most consistent visual motifs is the character wipe where human figures float across the surface of the screen like cardboard cutouts, or in other words, like drawings on celluloid. When they slide across the screen, the figures don't occupy any sense of three-dimensional space, but instead appear as two-dimensional layers. This effect is of course achievable with the use of green screen, which in a way is a kind of digital version of cell animation for live action footage. At its core, it separates foreground from background, character from environment. But what matters is that Speed Racer doesn't try to create the illusion of foreground and background merging together, like Disney aims to do, or that most contemporary movies do with their use of computer-generated backgrounds. Instead, Speed Racer celebrates its status as a composite image by showing us the seams between the layers. And in doing so, the film might be understood not just as an ode to cell animation, but as an ode to anime. As he explains in his book, The Anime Machine, Thomas Lamar argues that anime tends toward what he calls animatism, a way of depicting space in cell animation that acknowledges, rather than conceals, the flat layers of transparent celluloid that comprise the image. 
In contrast to what he calls cinematism, which attempts to produce the illusion of moving through an inhabitable world, often through forward movement, animatism separates the image into multiple planes. The very multiple planes of transparent celluloid that are vertically stacked on the animation stand. Animatism is not about movement into depth, but movement on and between surfaces. Speed Racer finds a way to import this movement between surfaces into live action filmmaking. One way it does this is with those strange human figure wipes, but it does this throughout the film in even more sophisticated ways. If we look closely at the opening shots of the film, for instance, we'll see that the lockers move laterally across the surface of the screen like cell layers. We don't so much feel as if we're moving forward through space. Rather, to borrow Lamar's description of similar simulated camera movements in anime, the elements in different layers will appear to pull apart or to draw closer together as they become smaller or larger, as you track in or out. The effect is like that of curtains opening and closing. Or in extreme deep focus compositions like these, we can see that foreground and background characters aren't captured by the same camera, but are clearly composited together as individual layers. A similar effect happens with simulated bokeh effects that emphasize this separation between foreground and background. In fact, entire action set pieces will be designed in this way. In the desert landscape of the Casa Cristo race, the sand dunes in the background don't move as if they're simply three-dimensional models. Rather, they're modeled in such a way that we see them as two-dimensional layers that slide across the surface of the screen. Another technique from anime that the film recreates is rapid lateral camera movement. As an example of limited animation, rather than full animation, anime tends to favor lateral camera movement because it allows animators to save labor. Instead of redrawing perspectival shifts every frame, animators can simulate a rapid lateral camera movement with abstract motion lines on a loop. What results isn't necessarily a convincing simulation of moving through space, so much as an abstract expression of pure motion. Speed Racer not only digitally reproduces these effects, it also takes advantage of what you can do with them. In this moment, a simulated whip pan seems to teleport us from the announcer to a close-up of speed. The abstract motion lines function as a kind of magical transitional device, getting us from any point A to any point B. And this happens throughout the entire film from relatively simple transitions across vast spaces to more ambitious transitions across time. As here, the abstract motion lines take us from Royalton threatening Speed's next race with corporate fixing to a close-up of Speed at that very doomed race. Speed Racer almost invents its own visual storytelling language by drawing from the layered aesthetic of anime. In other words, if many have observed the direct relation between the film's hyperkinetic visual style and its complex and ambitious storytelling techniques, especially its rapid transitions from one point of view to another, from one space to another, and often from one point in time to another, we also need to consider how these techniques can only make sense once we've abandoned the intuition that we're inside a world captured by a camera. The visual language of animation, especially animatism, is completely unfettered by this intuition. Still, though, the largely negative popular reception of Speed Racer suggests that these multi-planar effects might not have sit well with some audiences. And there may be good reason for that. As Thomas Lamar reminds us, when multi-planar effects appear in live action film, they often seem cheap, funny, or fake because our conventions of cinema lead us to expect the film to give us a sense of moving into the world, rather than having the services of the world slide by. In other words, such effects violate an expectation that we have about live action film that we don't have about animation, that the world in front of us was captured with a camera. Lamar's words here should help us understand why Speed Racer's ode to cell animation is not just an homage to the medium of its source material, but a way of acknowledging something about film history that most visual effects heavy films always try to conceal. Digital cinema is not a revolution in cinematic technology, but a return to cinema's roots in animation. 
Most digital effects heavy films try to conceal their status as essentially works of animation that are composited together with live action footage. And this is as true of effects heavy blockbusters as it is mystery thrillers and prestige dramas. But this doesn't change the fact that, in the words of film scholar Lev Manovich, digital cinema can no longer be clearly distinguished from animation. It's a particular case of animation which uses live action footage as one of its many elements. In its distinct design elements that recreate the techniques of cell animation and anime, as well as the technological foundations of animation more generally, Speed Racer proclaims the deep sympathies between digital cinema and animated cinema. In fact, the film seems to suggest that they're one and the same. <laughs>